Hello and welcome to episode three of A Recent Talks. I'm Sharina, I'm founder of A Recent Productions, a platform that allows African and African Caribbean creatives to grow and connect together in a safe space. So if you are new to a recent talks, um, welcome. And those of you who are coming back for more, great. You will know that what we try to do is have a nice chat with friendly faces from the black creative community. So one thing that I'd like to remind you of is that of course, this is free for you guys to watch, but we are a not-for-profit organization and there is a scan code on your screen. So if you can donate, um, we know these are difficult and straightened times, but any little bit helps so that we can keep doing what we do. So what I'd like to do now is introduce my first guest. So our first guest today is uh, a young man who graduated from Rose Bruford College in 2004. He began his TV career with British staples such as Casualty, The Bill, and Doctors. Uh, you may have seen him in season three of Peaky Blinders and um, Cleek and The Durrells. He played multiple roles in the initial UK run and world tour of Inua Ellum's wildly successful The Barbershop Chronicles in 2017 and as well as very recently on the national stage in Ellum's Three Sisters um, adaptation in 2020. He lends his voice to uh, an animated children's film called Watch the Skies, and he has a lead role in the soon to be released independent film, uh, Mindset. So welcome, Peter Bankale, to a recent talks. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for having me. Our, you <laughs> you're very welcome. It's lovely to have you. I'm great, I'm great. Our next guest um, is a born and raised Brixtonian. She first came to public fame as uh, a reggae artist under her moniker Lorna G in the late 70s, performing with sound systems like Naxty Rockers and Coxon, the mighty Coxon. She released multiple hit singles, including 1985's Gotta Find A Way, which spent six weeks on top of the reggae charts and won her best female artist in BBC Radio London's Reggae Awards in 1985 and 1986. She took on the US in the 90s and won the 1992 New York Tamika Reggae Award for best female DJ. In later life, she pursued her passion for acting and graduated from drama school, I hope she doesn't mind me saying, at the age of 40. She since appeared in films such as Run, Fat Boy Run and The Dark Knight. Her stage credits include The Crucible, The RSC, Guys and Dolls, and she played the original grandmother in Tina Turner, the musical. Please welcome Sitara Gale. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> wow, I had to cut those credits short because, you know, <laughs> women's got serious careers. Serious I was like, is that me you're talking about? Hold on, who else is talking about? <laughs> that is you, sister, all you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Sitara. Our third and final guest is a, a prolific award-winning writer who has had two books published in the last four months alone. You know, I just managed making bread during lockdown. <laughs> Man produced two books during lockdown. I mean, please. He was awarded the MBE for services to literature in 2008. His young adult novels set around the fictional South Crompton have won significant praise, as well as The Guardian's 2016 Children's Fiction Award. He has written two plays, Uprising and Shame and Scandal. In his youth, he founded Crucial Rocker Sound System, where he performed in Brixton under the name Yardman Irie, you know. <laughs> his life was recently chronicled in Steve McQueen's Small Axe Anthology. 
depicting his life as well as his involvement in the 1981 Brixton riots. Please, please welcome to the stage, virtual stage, Alex. <laughs> wow, can I go now? I mean, I can't, I can't go in that order. <laughs> I mean, how much experience is there in this virtual room? I mean, thank you guys for agreeing to be on the show. Um, we are in unusual, unprecedented times, as people always say, although there was the Spanish flu, but that was a long time ago. But, you know, we are all having to find our way in this new world. So how, how are we managing to do that? Let me ask back Peter, please, first. What have you been up to during lockdowns one, two and three? One, two and three, man. What's really helped me is having a routine, routine and structure. So a daily routine where I'll start by prepping my food for the day and getting in my reading. I've it's been such a good opportunity to educate myself on various topics. So I've been currently working my way through a list of books. I mean, I'm in my room at the moment where I'm looking at my books now. And some of these books have been life changing, you know, and mm -hmm. as well as getting the reading in, it's just been doing the daily exercise, which, you know, personally, I, I really need the endorphins from that. You know, it's just, it's such, um, it's such a good partnering with mental health. And I think during these yeah. times, that's something that we all need to monitor carefully and to, to look after and take care of. So reading, good food and exercise has just been the most for me during this time. That's how I've really mm. kept my head on my shoulders. Yeah, great. I mean, that's so important, um, mm. mental well-being. And I think for a lot of creators who watch this show because we've had such a, a break in our industry it's you know we're not able to do the thing that makes us you know it's, it's our bread and butter um what about you Alex how, how have you been obviously you had a creative spurt mm. I mean you wrote yeah four but three two books in the last well, four months um, I, I wrote them. I actually wrote them before lockdown. But to be honest, um, it's affecting me quite deeply because just before lockdown, um, the Compton Knights play was coming down to London. It was going to play at the Peckham Theatre and it was, it was going to sell out. You know, I was really looking forward to that. And I got to know the young actors. So to actually know now that um, their careers have been stalled because in quite a number of instances, this has been their big break. And to see them suffer because of this is so hard to take. And as we all know, the theatre industry, the government hasn't really helped at all. And so I feel really sad about that. And to be honest, it impacted on my own creativity. Obviously, um, you know, this has affected black people, you know, the COVID-19 more than um, other people. So um, I've been mindful about friends and family, especially abroad, because most of my family live in the US and it's been handled very badly out there. And so for quite a long while, lockdown one and lockdown two, I found myself very lethargic and I could not really create. But what got me out of that, as always has been the case, is reggae music. So I started to skank in my front room. Just wow. to let, <laughs> let off some energy yeah. and you know feel better about myself and try to be yeah. positive. I really needed to do that. So that kind of became my exercise. So um, you know, I do a bit of creating, I do a bit of dancing and skanking, and that kind of got me out of my um my fug. Yeah, yeah. Um actually music, just going to Satara now, is one of, of your links. So Alex, you had um, a past, as I um, hinted to in your bio, where you were, you created a, you started a sound system in Brixton. And Sitara, you had this whole career as a reggae artist extraordinaire. Have you turned to music to help you through lockdown? I never ever stopped. It's never, mm -hmm. it's never yeah. something that I stopped. Music has been a part of my life, you know, ever since I knew how to to sing or even to to listen to music. So it was never, it was never something that was halted, really. I think what's happened is, um, actually, I even got a call from uh, my one of my old producers who was saying that he wants to kind of bring out some of my backlog of stuff, you know, because we, I did a lot of music, but I never made an a, an album, um, and so 
yeah so we might be that's that's what's going to be happening we're going to be revisiting some of my stuff and you know right. I've, I've, you know written some 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 new stuff and yeah the music just keeps going you know but I think what I've been yeah. doing in the lockdown is just um it's given me just before the lockdown I just uh I, I was traveling a lot I, I mean I think the year before I, I was in, I was in India and then I went to to Portugal to stay with my brother for a mm-hmm. while and I, I also went to Jamaica to find m- more my mum's family and so when the lockdown happened I'd been going and you know traveling a lot and I tell you it gave me the opportunity to just stop to just be still and just reflect on <laughs> everything that's been happening everything that you know the the whole the whole thing, the whole journey, yeah. giving me mm. time to just yeah. Really, yeah. really, really reflect. You know what I mean? And it's just been, mm. it's just been amazing for that. Within that, there's been times when I've been peed off and it's like, you know, w- w- come on already. I want to, you know, but mm. I, I try not to dote on that for too long. I try Ooh. to just, you know, be in the moment. And and yeah. this. This is this has enabled me to really, really be present with with what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I completely identify with that. I mean, I certainly it gave me an opportunity to just pause and really tap into what I really wanted to do. Yeah. So I have this. I had this whole other career as a lawyer, as a barrister. And I really, and I enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. And I worked hard and, you know, to to get get to where I was. But it wasn't, it wasn't giving me love. You know, I, it it wasn't, it it, it wasn't the thing that I really wanted to do. And I wanted to focus on creativity. And I think having that, the lockdown and the pause made, brought that to the fore and made me, you know, sort of forced my hand, if you like, and, and made me, made me choose so I've sort of talked a bit about my background I want to talk please about what brought you guys to your careers your individual careers so Peter what was your inspiration for wanting to to become an actor where did that come from (laughs) um I'm laughing because I still remember the day I still remember the day I told my parents yeah I'm gonna do this and uh what did they, they say like, did they say what do you mean well you, you know what I, dance. <laughs> yeah, you know what my, my parents are nigerian my mom is Igbo, and my dad is yoruba and for a lot of nigerian parents there is you know a stereotype that you're wanting to be like a lawyer a doctor an accountant mm. and it's not to say that that's not true for many a household but within my household when i told my parents this their reaction was, oh, you finally, you finally realised what your talent is. Oh. And I was just like, rah. Because <laughs> from, from primary school, I was into cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons. I was into kung fu films. I used to watch so much TV and films, and I loved doing impressions. So in primary school, I would, I would entertain the people in my class by doing impressions of our teachers. And this is something that went on throughout school. It followed me into secondary school. I do impressions of other students and teachers. And funny enough, I always knew that I loved acting, but because of the lack of representation on screen, especially in the UK, in America, you know, Denzel was doing the thing. Angela Bassett was doing the thing. Robin Givens, like there were so many that I saw as examples. But in the UK, there was only a few. There were people like Lenny Henry doing their thing. And... um, you know, Norman Beaton, may rest in peace. And I, but I didn't see loads and loads of examples. Mm. And so You've I felt like... You've worked with Lenny Henry, haven't you? You worked have, with I've him in the Human Zoo. Yeah, I've worked with him three times now. I've had the pleasure of working wow. with him three times. And so when, when it came to a parents' evening one time, when I was about 15, normally the, re- the response wouldn't be too good. They'd be like, Peter Clown's around, or, you know, he's always making people laugh. If it wasn't PE or drama, anything else, I'd kind of be like just burying my head in my hands, waiting for the bad feedback. But there was one year where my drama teacher, Mrs. Byfield, you know, God bless her, she said to my mum, your son has, he has a real talent, and I think you should look into investing in it. 
when she told me that, I was scared. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was 15 and she said, you know, your, your teacher thinks you should pursue it. And it scared me. And I think the reason why it scared me is because I felt like it, it was too good to be true. One, it was too good mm. to be t- true. And two, it felt too far-fetched a dream for me to be able to grasp it. You know, it felt too far-fetched a goal for me to be able to achieve. And so, yeah. you know, I kind, of, I kind of rejected the idea at first. And it wasn't until a conversation with a good friend of mine about six months later where I realised, actually, I'm, I'm going to do this. So from the age of 15, that's when I knew, OK, mm-hmm. I'm actually going to go into this. And then it was about trying to ascertain what's the best path to getting towards being in the industry, doing yeah. films, TV, theatre. I mean, representation is so important. I mean, we've touched upon this theme time and time again in previous shows of the recent talks about how important it is to see, you know, someone from your community doing the thing you want to do, whether it's acting, singing, dancing, or being a barrister in in my case. Um, You know, Alex, what was your inspiration to become a writer? Because, I mean, I mean there weren't a lot of writers black writers Mm. that I would told I was told about at school I mean I went to school in Leeds there there was no black writers on our reading lists well this is why I always always champion creativity because um, I had such a troubled um, childhood but um, that trauma had to go somewhere and it had to come out in writing and at first I started to write lyrics but the problem was especially reading Brixton is that I took so long to write a lyric sometimes weeks and months while all these other um, DJs they could just do it this one time you know I'm talking about people like Tipper, Champion, Marshall Lee, mm. Chubba Ute from Safana B, Ricky Rankin, Barnett Rona, Papa Levi, Asher Senator. They were so good and they could just think of a lyric on the spot. I was never, ever like that. I could never just uh, go to a dance and freestyle. I had to go home, get out my notebook, get out my biro and work on it and work on it. And yeah. that kind of notebook turned into a journal. And I used to pour out all my um, angst and agonies and uh, trauma into this journal. And I I kept it. And uh, it it was quite um, therapeutic for me because I was venting all the emotions that I had growing up as a child, as an abused child. And so I really needed that creativity for me to come to terms and process whatever's happened to me. And later on... um, I think it was in mid 1980s. There was a lovely sister called Sister Claudette, and she used to have poetry jams in the arches um, in Brixham, poetry night. So I used to go up there, and that's where I gained my confidence, where I could, um, uh, re- you know, relate whatever happened to me in poetry mm-hmm. or lyrical form. And that's what set me on the road because after that, I began to write short stories. I mean, later on, obviously, I wrote novels. But initially, it was reggae music. I really wanted to uh, replicate what was happening around me. But because I was a different kind of animal, when it comes to uh, creating um, what I had to on the page, it just took me that bit longer. But in a way, that helped me because I could focus focus mm. every night before I went to bed and just write a little something and add to it the next day, the next week, the next month. So it really gave me a discipline that uh, I still work to to this day. I mean, but did but did anyone say to you, you know, when you expressed to anyone that this desire to be a writer, did, did, any, did were you encouraged in they that? They laughed. Most people laughed. Yeah. The, the only person who didn't laugh was um, the guy I met in prison, Simeon. He, he encouraged yeah. me because he used to tell me that everybody, everybody has a talent and the duty of anybody is to go out there and find it and then offer it back to the community. That was his philosophy. And so I stuck to that. I mean, he was the only one in school. It wasn't really recognized. They tried to push me into um, carpentry or finding a trade or something like that. And um, he was the only one. So when I when I emerged from prison, I kept that in my head. And I used to go to Brixton Library almost daily, almost daily, mm-hmm. just to read up, find fiction that related to me, that I can engage with those stories. And um, I flew from there. 
And just, yeah. um, I, d I don't know if Lord remembers, there was this, um, there was a Farnaby record shop, and then there was a general record shop deeper into the market run by a guy called Harris. And George, George used to uh, be, be behind the counter. And when they first started Nasty Rocker, I was asked to build, I think, the first couple of speaker boxes for that sound system. So that's um, where we have another link. All right. Okay. Well, but yeah, you, you mentioned the sound system, but you both were in an episode of the Small Axe series of, of films. And just before I bring Sitara into this um, aspect of the conversation, I just want to show um, a clip from um, the Small Axe um, episode that was based on your life, Alex. Um, so let's just give the viewers. For me, it was always about the music. Uprising, this an uprising. There ain't no work and we have no shilling. We can't take no more of this suffering. So we ride to a brick star. We can't take no more of this suffering. So we ride in a brick star. Oops, sorry. Now, um, I watched, I had the pleasure of watching that, um, well, I watched all of them. Yeah. Um, it, it was such, and I messaged you, actually, Alex, right after I watched that. And that's, that was the beginning, beginning of the conversation to get you onto the show, because it was so inspiring. It was yeah. so inspiring to, to see that, you know, at every stage of your life where you encountered difficulties, you still triumphed over that. And Sitara, I wonder whether you can give us a sense of you know your your journey because i know that you have a background of being in the in the care system is that right yeah <clears throat> i remember when i was watching uh, well i mean i know about alex anyway because i've i've even been to i don't even know if you remember that i even came to your house one time <laughs> do you remember i came to your flat I was yes i was talking to you about your books um uh, but but my my yeah it's it, but there's a lot of similarity there, um, yeah I, you know I was brought up in the, the care system also, and um, between home and 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 the care system because I I think you know as a, as a youngster I I wasn't uh, I was a bit lippy and you know a bit lippy they say a bit lippy and school <laughs> school wasn't the, the the greatest place for me at all. The only thing, I was reading some of my care reports recently, and they said the only thing that keeps Lorna in the room is when they are storytelling or, um, or when she's um. writing a story. Because apart from that, I used to wonder, I just used to wander to other classes and, uh, you know, <laughs> end up wherever. Um, and so music was the thing that I think, you know, when, when we started the sound systems, uh, when I started going to the dance and going to the blues dance and just watching the vibes and feeling the vibes and feeling the bass in my in my soul, my gosh, I felt like I was at home. It was like, wow. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that my, that's how I started writing lyrics. I started writing lyrics. And, and just like what Alex was saying, it came from my pain, my struggles, what I was seeing. I, I was saw a lot. You know, I saw a lot of what was going on with the sus laws. I, I was out there. I saw a lot of what was going on. And so that's what I was writing about and, and things that I was experiencing as a young, you know, black girl in, you know, mm. in, in London, Brixton, you know. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's where it all, that's kind of where it yeah. was. Like, yeah. it? And, so, and so, mm. Sorry, no, continue. As a, as, as a youngster wanting to, to be an actor, you know, my mother was a very, very strict Seventh Day Adventist, and we grew up in a Seventh Day Adventist church. And when it comes to, you know, those things, it was like, you know, you mean acting? If you want to hack, you come hack the Lord. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, you know. I was like, Mom, I want to go to, you know, we used to walk past um, Italia Conte that school. Mm -hmm. uh, go to church and I used to see all the you know I mean all the little white girls going in there with their tutu and everything and I was like oh my god I want to be there I don't know how I, why I wanted to, but I know that that's what I wanted to do I just needed to be there and it was just you know I was never able to to go but you know it never mm -hmm. leaves you 
Mm. No, and you you found that you found that way to to tap into that creative expression. And now now Peter, your as, as you've told us, your your inspiration was a little different. You 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 were clearly a born uh, <laughs> sort of performer, and Close. and that was that was spotted quite happily by a teacher, which again has happened in other people's life. There's you know there's always someone I think who you know whether with it, with Alex it was his his cellmate and also the, the the woman the the sister who ran the the poetry and with Sitara it'll be someone else again but there's always someone I think who recognizes that spark in 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 us and um just Peter tell us about really you know your your creative process because you know you've been in some very popular stage shows so so we know that you were you were in um, um the barbershop chronicles and you were you were in um three sisters i've got a a, a picture of you here um wow. on stage at the national and now that that's a mighty stage the national i mean it's uh, it's 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 a big thing i mean how did you deal with the sort of enormousness of you know being on the stage as a you know a, a black actor in a black production at the national um luckily going to drama school gave us real preparation for that you know just from from a technical point of view um you're trained how to use your voice efficiently no matter what the space is whether it's 200 whether it's a thousand whether it's two thousand you learn how to connect the physical life with your vocal life. And from that combination of the two, as well as other nuances surrounding your, your personal being, and to formulate a character. And no matter what size the stage is, you develop a skill that means that you can produce something regardless of the size or the enormity or the minuteness of the space that you're in. And my first job out of drama school in theatre was at the RSC. I had the blessing of being there for 18 months. And I did five plays in the space of 18 months. So my CV started to stack in a year and a yeah. half with five plays. And back then, this is like 2005, this is a few moons ago now. But back then, the RST, the, the way in which it was set up from an, um, an architectural point, it was like three tiers, massive stage that would seat 1,500 mm -hmm. people. And at that point in time, as a 22-year-old, I remember experiencing and feeling, if you can handle a space of this magnitude, that you can handle anything. You know, like this here is you breaking the ice with enormous spaces in theatre. Yeah, I'll say that I mean, just say, sorry, just to yeah. interrupt you there, Peter. I mean, what do you say to? Because I work with a lot of in our theatre company, we work with a lot of actors who, who haven't been, haven't had formal drama school training, or they've they've done sort of you know evening courses or short courses, and so they don't have that you know I suppose the confidence that's imbued in you know your full time drama graduate. I mean, so how? What do you say to them? I mean it's yeah <laughs> what can we what what advice can you give them to be honest you know drama school training was amazing for me personally you know it was fantastic and not only was it a lesson in how the actor prepares but it was a lesson in who I am as a person away from home mm. who I am as a person entering into an industry that um is far away from you know, what's been in my family's blood lineage. I don't come from a family of artists, even though my dad likes to, <laughs> that's a claim out yeah, artistic movie, it goes from me. <laughs> but, you know, it's not what he did as a profession, it's not what my mum did either. So, although I did learn from a, a theory base and a practical base of how to perform as an actor and how to prepare, the real advancement of the learning came from actually doing it so rsc felt like training 2.0 you know everything that i've learned yeah. now it's time to put it into practice so for anyone that's doing like an evening course or a part-time course you be the sponge if you can i mean not 
you know, during these circumstances right now, it's, it's tough because theatre's on a hiatus, right? But, you know, in a world that's more normalised that we recognise, any opportunity that you can get, if you can go to a smaller fringe theatre, you know, because I know theatre can be pricey as well, so yeah. for people in the community, it's not so accessible. But if you can go to a smaller fringe space, or if there's anything you can find online, and seeing how people negotiate the space, how they interact with their fellow actors as well as the audience, it's a real skill set. And I believe that you can mm. learn so much from observing it. Starting from there, I think, is a really good place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Satare, I mean, did you get, have formal drama school training? What's, what was your, your, well, you actually, you did. You, went, you graduated from drama school um, when you were 40. So what made you do the change from singing to, to acting? Um, I think, you know, it's, you know, my son was starting to go, getting ready to go to secondary school. And I, I was, <coughs> you know, 35. And I was like, you know, I want to start doing something different. I want to start doing my other passion and something that, you know, where I can get regular work and where I can get an agent. And then my agent will, mm. because trust me, in this reggae business, I fought a lot of producers and a lot of promoters. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of people trying to think, you understand? So... <laughs> I found for years, I was like, give me my money, give me my money, ah, give me my money. I mean, it was like that for so many years that it got to a point mm. where, you know, you just get discouraged. You know what I mean? You get discouraged. And and um, I'll blame myself for that because I didn't know enough about the business. I did it for the love of it. I did it for the love of paperwork and all of that kind of stuff. Was It's just, not, that's not me. I'm just the creative side. So I lacked on, on a lot of that. And, and that's why I've actually formed a company to, 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 to address that, that kind of thing now for, for, for mm. up and coming artists. But, you know, um, so, so it got to the point where I wasn't being fulfilled anymore and 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 I said I want to I want to be a professional and I want to be a professional at something that I love and as I said I wanted to get an agent and 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 that's how it happened you know one day in my in my flat my dear friend Kofi is another beautiful singer we used to write songs together and I was just I just voiced that to her and I said to her you know I want to I want to do something different man and she was going to college at the time she was doing a, a production course at college at Lucian College, and she said, "Well, you know, they got you know, you love your acting. Why don't you come and do an acting course in in Lucian College?" And I, as soon as she said it, it was like, "Wow, mm, yeah. of course, of yeah. course, yeah, <laughs> yeah." yeah. This is, you know, it's something that I used to do before when I was a child. You know, I loved it, mm. and that's what how it happened. I went to um, Lucian. I did my um, B Tech in Performing Arts for two years. And I just had the best teachers ever. I had one particular one, Mark Sell. He was amazing that he just saw something me, was like, mate, you know, you need to go to drama school. So I was 35 years old. I didn't know nothing about drama school. I didn't know that you could go to drama school at my age. I, I had yeah. no idea about that whole world. But they, you know, they encouraged me. They um, um, educated me about it, you know, and, and helped me to mm -hmm. get a... a a monologue Shakespearean monologue and you know modern and yeah I started auditioning and auditioned for five different drama schools and I got into Weber Douglas um, yeah yeah that's amazing I mean you mentioned there your that you founded a, a drama school Sitara Academy mm. um and you know the I, I, well tell us what the the rationale was behind that I suspect to it to ease the pathway into the profession for for black up and coming actors. Absolutely, I mean, I started like you know maybe around two thousand. I think it's two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, and it's something I've always done and I've always enjoyed. I working in youth centres and you mm. know it was and 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 working doing drama with young people. I was working for a lot of different um, organizations. So I just decided to just start up an organization for myself. Um, mm. We started in Brixton, you know, I saw that there was, there was nothing that I saw, there was nothing for, for the young people at the time, you know, I couldn't fit and, and I remember what it was like for me growing up wanting to do drama and I'm not seeing anyone like me, you know, at drama, mm. the drama 
people's and that was that was my motivation behind it it was like you know what i'm going to start up a little center and i just went and got a little center and you know just it's just having good people behind you too you know yeah. help you mm. to to fulfill that and and that's where it all started you know so. yeah yeah i mean i think that that guidance if you can get it from very early on is is so important and i know um alex you you do work in schools don't yeah. you oh yes uh, many schools up and down the country um in europe on the continent in um, as far away as new zealand i've uh, worked in schools wow. facilitated workshops um one of the greatest highs of my life was to go to um, the South Africa, Cape Town, where I visited a number of schools, about six, seven schools there, and um, facilitated creative writing workshops with them. Because sometimes, as Lorna says, it's so hard to be um, what you can't see. And so uh, there, were, there was hardly anybody for me. I remember my first manuscript. I remember going to uh, an address in Chelsea Harbour with my manuscript tucked under my arm. And I didn't know that um, your sentences had to be double spaced. I didn't know that you can make deletions with your biro. I didn't know that um, the manuscript with um, burnt, burnt cigarette holes in it would be a, would not be acceptable or jam on some of the pages. I had no idea about these things until I... I had that experience where the receptionist told me that um, I better clean up my manuscript, make sure it's clean, make sure there's no jam on it or burn holes in it <laughs> and double space it. Oh, it was a nightmare, but um, trying and error. But what kept me going yeah. was I had that perseverance and that's what everybody has to acquire. I mean, I'm sure there's many others who've been just as talented or if not more talented than I am, but I really wanted it. So I honed my craft, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and I stuck to it and I persevered because uh, my first manuscript was written something like 1993. I was not published until 1999. So, you know, I had a long journey to get there. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But, you know, you've got to want it. You've you got to persevere yeah. and, and take the knockbacks when they come and rise above them. Yeah, absolutely. And did you, I mean, did you study writing? Was there any? Um, not really. Did you do it? No. No, You're just not a natural. At all. I mean, I, I, I mean, I read, I, I got your book the other day. I've got a few to read, obviously, because you've got, the, you're, you're prolific. But this, I read this, and I mean, first of all, I was like, oh my God, suppose I don't like the book, what am I going to say to him? <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> so what am I going to say? But thankfully, I love this, so let me tell you, I mean, it took me back to the days, I mean, you know, I know I don't look at it because black don't crack, but I, you know, I did the whole Shabin thing, I was in a sound, yeah. I had my, my, my cousins were in Trojan sound, young Trojan, right. young Trojan. <laughs> My my sound name was was Champagne. My other cousin was right. Can I? Listen, we had it. <laughs> so this this took me back to them days when we used to leave house at midnight, right? Yeah, <laughs> and go to party yeah. and come back at five a.m. Pick up the milk from the doorstep and yeah. creep in the house. <laughs> I mean, it had me laughing and crying. It it was just fantastic. And I was like, where did this where did this dude learn to write like this? Well, I, I used to say to myself, when I got interested in writing, when I was, say, 19, 20, I used to go to the bookshops and I used to look for um, books that I could relate to, but I couldn't find them. The only thing I could really relate to that was in published form was probably um, Linton Quaity Johnson and his poetry. And that was about it. I couldn't find any narrative text. So I always had to dip into the American bag. But I said to myself, well, where's our story? Because um, it was Simeon who told me, Alex, your story is just as important as anybody else's. Don't let anyone tell you different. And so the life that I lived, that Luna lived, or anybody who uh, was around at that time, who lived the kind of life where I used to hang out in record shops, go to dances, get my entertainment that way, go to town hall, dance, come home, then maybe go to the A cinema, watch a kung fu film and look for blues. Um, you know, I, I you remember the be... one. You remember the the cinemas at the Elephant Castle. Yeah. Do you remember those? I used to yeah. watch Kung Fu movies there. Yeah. It was just. It was they just just start about the midnight. They just start about midnight, yeah. and then we, on the way home, you might stop at a front line and buy two dumpling or whatever, and go home and hit your bed. 
and and then and wow. then we get home and you know we compare what uh, girls numbers we picked up that particular evening so I, I i wanted to see that on the page you know i wanted yeah. to see my yeah. life my friends life the people who i knew because their their narrative is just as important as anybody else's why should they be left out of fiction so that's yeah. what i started that's to write bricks and rock and and uh forgive me luna <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, Luna, because that's a title. But it's a great title. It's a fantastic title. So, what oh, did you teeth it? Did you teeth it from Sutara? You <laughs> it from me, the man of pirate. The man of the pirate. I, I, I confess. I confess. I haven't confessed. In There's no such before, thing as an original idea. You know There's what? There's no such uh, thing as an original idea. You know what I mean? Mm. Brixton Rock. It's uh, it's all good, man. It ain't nothing because yeah. you know it's, it's, this is it. You you grew up in Brixton too. You got a right, Alex. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm oh, we've got we've got a question here. We've got a question here. Sorry, um, Alex. What good habits do you suggest aspiring writers to take on? Um, I would suggest to anybody, whether it's writing or acting, to find your own little creative space and protect that. And so, if your creative space is a half an hour on a Saturday, protect it. Interfere with that. And, you know, it becomes a precious thing, your own creative space. And in that creative space, you can produce half a page, a page, or maybe do some acting drills or whatever it may be. But try to protect your creative space and don't let anyone tell you that you're wasting your time. You know, go to the, um, the supermarket or go to shopping, protect that creative space. Discipline yourself. So we've, we've touched upon, you know, the importance of representation. And, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons that I started a recent, um, a recent um, productions was because I wanted to provide, you know, more opportunities for black creatives to, to depict roles that weren't stereotypical, but also to take charge of the narrative. Uh, and so, Peter, I wonder if you have any desire, aspirations to write or create plays or direct you know, other than, you know, being on the stage, do you have any any aspirations? It's funny, you know, I've got friends, many talented friends who write, who direct, who produce as well as acting. For me, at this present time anyway, I love acting and storytelling so much. Mm. I always have done that it feels like my plate is very happily filled with that, with that blessing in and of itself. But I do sometimes have like little flashes of ideas for writing and for direction. I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a nerd for certain things. So when I'm watching films- Like TV, what? <laughs> oh, martial arts, music. <laughs> uh, yeah. In recent years, biology I was kind of interested in school because I was into working out and things like that but um yeah bi biology anything to do with function of the human body and the, the anatomy things to do with like the um, intricacies of brain function I've just become oh, very right. interested in it and also mm -hmm. in history any history that pertains to the African experience and experiences of countries mm. that were under the Commonwealth. So people of melanin the world over and just learning yeah. how much history. There was a phrase I heard where history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And when you look at the history of our people of melanin, a lot of that history does rhyme and it rhymes mm. often mm. and consistently. So that's become a vested interest, cultural interest. But um, mm. as far as like, directing and writing yeah so when i say i'm a nerd for certain things when i'm watching film when i'm watching tv i see the work of dops and definitely appreciate mm. it and i'm inspired by it and sometimes i think if i get my directing hat on one day i imagine i may shoot something you know with with the objective of this or and i go into a little space sometimes in my mind of creativity but the desire to actually cross over the line and begin the mm. writing and the directing process isn't there yet yeah maybe one day. okay maybe one day. yeah <laughs> I mean it's it is it is very Im important the you know what I say about you know taking charge of the narrative because I mean I recently um watched this movie 
everybody's heard of it, you know, The Help. I, I didn't watch it when it came out, but I decided <laughs> because I was like, I don't, I, I, I don't need to be seeing that really. But um, I thought I'd watch it because, you know, because of the recent passing of um, Cicely Tyson. Oh, my gosh, what a terrible movie. It was just a terrible movie. And then I Googled the writer and I realized the writer's uh, a, a white woman. And, you know, I'm not saying that white writers can never write good black characters. I think they probably can. But I think not in that instance. And that's why I think it's very important for us to take charge of the narrative. And Sitara, you're, you, you were speaking about the project. You, you're trying to get a project that you've written, is that right? On, onto yes, the yeah, stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, um, it's going. It's, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's going on stage. We've been commissioned. Um, oh, on, great. Yeah, all of this happened before lockdown. I've been working on it for the last four years with Hackney Showrooms. Um, and before that, I was working on it a couple of years before that. So it's a story that, um, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've wanted to tell. I feel that's necessary to tell. And just like, you know, um, Alex and Peter, I, I didn't see, I don't see my narrative or, on the on the on the media and if you leave it to someone else to write it they're not they're not going to tell the, mm. the whole truth you know so you know that is why i said you know what let me write my story and it mm. is it's yeah. a story about the journey it's a story about my mother it's a story about my sister it's a story about nanny of the maroons it's about how the blueprint of these women and the, the blueprint of my life and how our lives ran parallel and still does mm. to this you know mm. so um mm. oh it's very much it's actually also um talking to talking to a couple of uh, tv producers who wants to who's read the script and they want to make mm. it into a, a drama so um fantastic yeah, thank you. so yeah so that's, yeah, well done well that's done gonna be, that's gonna be as soon as we can we can uh do yeah. something as soon as the lockdown's over yeah. we'll be able to yeah. share some really I mean, I mean, you mentioned just just in 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 that story in that excerpt about Nanny of the Maroons, and you know, I'm just latch, latching on to Nanny, the word Nanny, because of course you were the first, the original grandmother in Tina Turner, the the musical. Uh, I'm just gonna here's a clip of you, um, <laughs> uh, an image of you on stage. <laughs> I love that face. That's like your it's, it's like Bex. your mama. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, I saw the, the musical, sadly, not with you in it. And um, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. But what struck me was that, you know, there was this virtually an, all, an overwhelmingly all black cast, but an overwhelmingly all white audience. I mean, it was like me and like one other sister. Right. And that's because it's so expensive. You know, I think I think, you know, it was like it was something ridiculous, like 200 pounds a ticket. And, you know, and this is one of the other things about recent productions. We want to try and bring theatre to the communities. Yeah. You know, our first production was in like a, a disused converted motorbike garage around the corner. And we just, you know, charged £10 yeah. for it. And, you know, people just came out of largely out of curiosity, but they'd never actually seen a lot of them hadn't seen live live theatre before. So, you know, yeah. what, are, what are people's views about how we how we you know, sort of break that cycle of really expensive, our stories being put on really expensive stages, which is nice. It's good. I love it. I'm going to go to the National. Wherever, Sitara, wherever your story is told, I'm going. I will pay 200 pounds. Okay. I'm, 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 do do? I'm writing, I know who I'm writing my story for. I, I'd love the whole world to see it, but I know yeah. who I'm writing my story for. Yeah. It's for us. It's our story because we are invisible. We're invisible on screen. Yeah. It's like it's like we never lived. It's like there's the black generation in the 70s and the 80s. Thank God yeah. Steve McQueen just did something recently to 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 even stir something to yeah. start something, absolutely you know of our lives. But before that, we were un, you know, invisible. It's like yeah. our yeah. life didn't happen here. We were born here in England and we had a we had a journey. We had a life here. We had experiences here. And it's not really told. That yeah. was a yeah, absolutely and even, and even before the 70s. I mean even I, before um, the 70s 
of course, really interesting of course, of course. about the, BL, the the hashtag BLL movement is all this coming to the, the resurgence of our history on this island, which goes back centuries. Sorry, Alex, I interrupted you. Yeah, Thank can you. I follow up on um, um, Tatawa's point? You know, there's been a big debate recently about um, black actors um, maybe taking over white roles. Like, for instance, there's a new program called um, uh, Anne Boleyn, I believe. Boleyn. There's a black actress playing that. And then there's a debate about Bridgerton. You know, is that really authentic? But for me... I'm more concerned. I am much more concerned as a creative, as a black creative, of seeing Tatara's story commissioned for Sky or Netflix or whoever it is, because her story is just as vivid, just as magnificent as anybody out there. So I'm more concerned about that. We should be, um, we should be lobbying about Satara's narrative and other narratives that we haven't seen yet, rather than try to fit us into these white roles. I'm more concerned about our narrative, our histories, our stories. And so what C. McQueen did, I think, you know, whether you like all the episodes or not, at least he started to tell our stories and we should Absolutely. appreciate that. And we should, um, the broadcasters should really have a good look at themselves. And we, we've been shortchanged, as Lorna says. Oh, Sorry, Tatara. We have been absolutely shortchanged. It's now time for our narrative to flower. It really is. And, and yeah, the, absolutely. absolutely. The only yeah. way... The only way we're going to really get through it is to really start writing our own stories. Um, Alex, what you're doing, you're writing your books. And for all of us, you know, we're playing our parts. It's just, write your story, man, because yeah. you know, you get it. they said that, you know, in order to write your, 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 your life, make sure you hold the pen. You know, because yeah. others will take it as as we've seen through history. Look at the stories that they're telling about our history. It's the same as as Peter said, it's rhyming, man. It's just rhyming, rhyme. You know, it's the same repetitive. You Ooh. know, we we're rich. Yeah. We've got so many rich, beautiful stories. So many, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, and it, contemporary it, ones too. I don't know why we have to reach into the past forever. You know, I'm so fed up yeah. of uh, the slave narrative. Okay, yeah. I know there's some important stories to be told there. But, you know, we do have a completely different history also, yeah. which is, as you say, Sitara, rich, rich and on this very island and contemporary stories that are just happening outside my door. I mean, you know, I live in New Cross Gate. I mean, you know, there's drama, good, bad Everywhere. and ugly every day, Everywhere. which would be wonderful and yeah. watchable and relatable on screen. But do I see yeah. that? No. Things are beginning. I mean, so we've got to do it. Things are beginning to yeah. change. And Ooh. I think, you know, this lockdown, this whole um, Black Lives Matter, the, the, the whole George Floyd thing, something mm. is happening. Something yeah. is happening. Is. There's a shift yes. that's yes. going on right yeah. now. There and is a shift. Like, but we need to maintain focus main, and momentum because listen, there's listen. there's some tokenism going on. Yeah, there's yeah. like that. Let's but just listen, give them a little crumbs on the table. Quiet. It depends on what we focus on. We can, mm. if we're going to focus on the tokenism, if we're going to focus on, it depends on what, what do we want? It's about getting what we want, what clear and buck, what was ours. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's about getting it. And we can sit there and think, oh, well, this has happened for some, because this is what we're talking about. This has happened. And, we, you know, some of us, we've been shortchanged, but it's not about complaining and sitting there and saying, oh, we've been mm. shortchanging. And because that's not going to be productive. It's mm. what to do about it and yeah. we can't let it up we can't say oh yeah we have things are changing now and just just sit on it we have to be that change yes yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. and i think and I, and I think that is coming you know i see quite a lot of um young black creators in, emerging up and coming who are you know taking charge of their narratives they're writing their stories you know and they're not waiting for commissioners they're they're, they're mm -hmm. doing it themselves they're, they're they're filming themselves on their phone and they're putting together stuff and they're putting it out there and you know maybe that's those small steps that they have to make before they find that you know sort of bigger stage wider audience but definitely i i feel as though change is coming but it's you know it's not coming yeah. in here. It's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that what them young people are doing. They're just taking the oh man its horns and just saying, listen, this is what I'm doing. I'm I'm telling you, they're fearless, man. They're fearless and fearless. Yeah. Yeah. What they're doing right now. 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I definitely sense that. I mean, Alex, you must have seen that as well in the the young people that you talk to in schools, and you know Absolutely. that energy. Well, just being around the young actors who um who uh, played played out in Crompton Nights, just to see that energy, mm. that first for knowledge, that first for experience, that really encourages me. So when people ask me, Alex, what do you think the future holds? It's in good hands. It's in very good hands. We just need the platform. Just going to flash up your book. Themselves. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned Crompton Nights. That's, that's um, um, one of three books, isn't it? With, one of your three books in the series, the Crompton yeah. series. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. With that regard, I'm um, in the process of setting up my own television production company called Bricks and Bars. Um, I've already started to film a short that uh, I couldn't quite complete because of the lockdown, but I hope yeah. to um, finish that short very soon. And this like this like I just want to establish a platform and leave a legacy. Oh. Yeah, you know. So yeah. and 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 as Satara says, the change is happening because for years and years, my phone was cold from all these um, people who would greenlight projects in television, BBC, Sky, whatever. All of a sudden, it's become a lot warmer. So watch yeah. your space. Yeah, watch your space. Yeah. yeah, no, I have definitely noticed that there's there's more interest. From, from white creatives in yeah. in working collaboratively in you know listening to our stories uh, and, and and I think there are there are allies and we need them I mean you know we need people who are on our sides of every hue that's fine but what what I want to ensure is that we are in the forefront when we're talking about our stories so we don't get things like the help you know I mean Alex yeah. I'll come to you. <laughs> if you do anything like that, brother, I will come to you. Uh, I know you won't. I know you won't. But, you know, that's why we have to properly take charge. And, you know, and I really saw that when I, you know, so when I was watching Small Axe. I mean, you know, you know, your your performance, Sitara, in 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 the episode that you, the, the Red, Right, Red, Right and Blue, um, Le yeah, Leroy right. Logan's story. Right. I mean, it was just so natural. The young people were so convincing and natural. Were they trained actors or were they just, I mean, how did they do the casting for that? Do you know? Yeah, I think they were. I think they were. I think it was, it was so of, natural of, 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 of trained and, and yeah, you know. it was so think, natural and believable. I think you don't you don't need trained actors to be truthful, you know. And um, people mm. feel that you know, and I need to go to drama school to actually, you know, just being real and 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 having a sense of who you are makes the best actors. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, it, I I had so much fun, and obviously working with John, man, you know what I mean. It was just so yeah. nice, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, that's lovely. Yeah, I mean, Alex, how did it feel seeing your life depicted wow. on stage? I mean, it was it was, it was um, surreal. Um, I remember Wait, going to the set. Oh, sorry, you're talking to Peter or me? No, I'm talking to you, Alex. I made a mistake. Oh, seeing it was your life um. Depicted screen surreal it was almost like i had passed away and i was floating mm -hmm. over these over the set seeing my own life replayed out to me i mean it's so lovingly my my little room in the hostel they so lovingly recreated all the um the flies and the posters the little record net that i had you know it's i thought wow oh my gosh it was like an out-of-body experience it really mm -hmm. was and i i feel i feel very honored because not many writers can say, not many living writers can say that they've seen a drama of their lives on prime time television. I mean, wow, what, what an honour. It really yeah. was. Right, we're going to have to wrap up now. We've got a couple of minutes. So I just, um, we've had quite a quiet audience today. Um, but, you know, I just want to close on sort of, I think we've been very inspirational, actually. I think it's been very positive chat. So well done, guys. Um, but I just want to close on, you know, sort of, Go round uh, a positive comment from from all of you. Can I start with Peter, please? Just something inspirational and positive. Put you on the spot. Um, from what's been said today from both Alex and Satura in terms of things changing, things changing in the name of inclusivity for, for black people and people of melanin within the arts, uh, I feel like the evidence is tangible. The success of shows like Bridgerton, 
where what we're seeing is people of melanin with affluent roles within society, which historically has been somewhat a part of erasure because we were here long before Windrush and these times as, as many a falsified narratives will tell you. So it's great that a show like that should break all view and records for Netflix. I think that's indicative of the fact that things are changing. Films like Rocks, Teresa Okoko, programs like I May Destroy You, Michaela Cole, our mm. people are penning and in front of the camera and behind the camera on fantastic cultural shifting, paradigm shifting narratives. So a time definitely is changing. You know, things yeah. definitely are coming around. And also with the pandemic, the more of, you know, the more as time goes on and modern medicine is doing its thing, we can start to think about going back into a world of normality and normalcy. Hopefully mm. with the lessons we've all learned during yeah. the last 12 months, you know, that's that's the hope, right? But um, yeah. right, I'm going to have to, Peter, I'm going to, I want to go okay. to Alex before we run mm -hmm. out of time. Alex, could you, uh, just a, a nugget Something well, well, young people um, are fearless anyway, but um, don't be afraid to express your own experiences, your life, your trauma. Your story, as I said uh, previously, is just as important as anybody else's, and so are your ideas. So never be afraid to express that, and never let anyone tell you that um, your story is somehow devalued against it, somebody else's. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. So Tara, would you sing out your inspiration? Come on, come on. Just, just, just out, man. Let's do a little improv. Let, come let go, let go and trust the flow. Let go and trust the flow. What's the use of worrying about something you can't fix? No. Oh, thank you so much, guys. This has been a wonderful hour. Thank you so much. Now, guys, don't forget, if you've loved this show, you can watch it, you can share it, you can watch it again and share it with your friends. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please, if you can, donate. There's all our socials and all our bits of information. Thank you very much. And we'll just close out now with our little video. in carnival you can't always stay in carnival guys we know we if you want i'm not going to trust you for them.